Hello, good morning. Thank you so much to the organisers for inviting me to be a part of Dark Archives 2020 and also to Stephen Pink, who was both supportive and extremely funny in some of his emails. My title today is The Book, The Whole Book, and Nothing But The Digital Surrogate. I'd like to start with some consideration of the terminology we use for digital images in relation to medieval artefacts. And I'll start with surrogate from my title, which the OED defines as a, a thing that acts for, takes the place of another, a substitute. Marilyn Deegan quite robustly challenges the notion of representation of an original by a surrogate, arguing that it's always problematic. In some sense, it's always a falsification. For Deborah McGrady, the digitized manuscript openly mocks the material object. It peddles in nostalgia. It cultivates a desire it cannot satisfy. The digitized manuscript promises intimate knowledge of a distant handcrafted object, but flaunts its status as a product defined by its distance from the desired original. An example of that distance from the original uh, might be a repository saying on its website, all of our medieval manuscripts are photographed at a minimum of 600 DPI. From a technological standpoint, that's precisely what we want. Um, but it's a reminder, as McGrady says, of the distance from the handcrafted object. To put it another way, the digitized manuscript is not the manuscript itself, as Doc Porter reminds us. And I can't think of a better example of the digitized manuscript not being the manuscript itself than Codex Amiatinus, which we see here on the Lorenziano's website. Um, or at least we see a digital image of it, um, flat, relatively high resolution, not the manuscript. In the bottom left-hand corner, the dimensions are indicated 500 by 335 millimeters. But even had we noticed those dimensions, I suspect that nothing would have prepared us for the experience of encountering the physical object itself. Here we see a photograph with one of the curators on the left-hand side to provide a sense of scale. What was it like to see this object? It created a sense of wonder, of, of awe. We might invoke Abraham Joshua Heschel and say there was a radical amazement. And of course, as we know, the de rigueur response of most hard-bitten medievalists encountering Codex Amiatinus was to weep. Returning to our consideration of terminology, Segal and Tart proposes the term avatar. Avatar does not imply any notion of replacement of the original. It simply and openly states that it is one of many possible representations or representations of the artifact. But it's Albert Campagnolo who best summarizes what I intend to do today, which in, with his argument that Digital surrogates have the potency to be more than mere replacements of the original objects. When the transformative nature of the digitization process is more fully harnessed, they can become digital cultural objects, digital objects that transcend the originals, that work in synergy with them and make them something more. And Campagnoli suggests that the best way to do this is to bring digital humanists and manuscript scholars and curators into conversation with one another to consider how we might best produce innovative, transcendental, transcending digital surrogates. And I think it's useful at this point to bring in Marshall McLuhan's comment that technologies are a way of translating one kind of knowledge into another mode. Now, as we know, every act of translation is also an act of interpretation, and we have to be very aware of the underlying principles of the technologies that create that interpretation. McLuhan goes on to say, the process of translation creates amplified and specialized forms. Here we see an image of the Lindisfarne Gospels floating in a kind of disembodied form. And here it is translated into something amplified and specialized through the wonders of microscopy. So here's Christina Duffy's enlargement of folio 44v of the Lindisfarne Gospels. It's 50 times magnification. I challenge anyone to have seen this for the first time and said, oh yes, Lindisfarne Gospels. Hey, maybe folio 44v. And it brings to mind Maura Nolan's comment that digitization penetrates the surface of the page with the power of the camera lens, laying bare secrets that have traditionally been safe from the gaze 
of the naked eye. And we can definitely say that this enlargement of the green pigment of the lower compartment of the, of the E here is something that had been safe from the gaze of human eyes until microscopy, microscopy revealed it. This looks like a sort of crazed green glass, doesn't it? Obviously, this is useful for the study of the composition of a pigment and for conservation purposes, but it's definitely something in McLuhan's term that's amplified and specialised. Returning to laying bare the secrets, safe from the gaze of the naked eye, we might think about the process of zooming an image, which we so much take for granted, we don't even think about it. And this enlargement here is well beyond anything that the human eye or even a magnifying glass could usually accomplish. And yet, we just zoom in. I'd like to now have a look at Arthur Napier's comment, looking at scratch glosses, where he says, I gave up the attempt of deciphering the glosses. It was so trying to my eyes, they were impossible to read. In my case, when I returned to material from his corpus, I had the benefit of Christina Duffy's assistant and multispectral imaging technologies. And here we can quite clearly see the Old English gloss Hloender that was almost invisible on the manuscript page. Here's another example of technology assisting maybe our idea of what a digital surrogate is uh, in relation to the original manuscript. This is the Codex Sinaiticus website. Um, on the left, we see the standard kind of washed out, almost bleached image, which we might be familiar with. On the right is the use of raking light, and I've combined the two images together here, which gives a, a better sense of the texture and contours of the page. Of course, it's still very far from being the manuscript. Here's another example of raking light from Brown University Library's website, which on the left shows etched palm leaves filled with ink, and on the right shows an etched palm leaf um, fragment which has not been filled with ink. So the palm leaf itself looks almost blank. Under raking light, the Sanskrit writing is very much apparent. Unlike the manuscripts themselves, repositories can choose to change their digital surrogates as often as they like. Digital surrogates are fluid. A repository may even silently replace existing provision with an updated set of imagery. So here in the case of the Golden Haggadah, the Hebrew manuscript from the 14th century, we can see a four panel scene here. I'm gonna focus on the panel in the top left-hand corner, which shows the Tower of Babel. The British Library provided this image in 2012. And then as part of the British Library Hebrew project, the manuscript was re-digitized. And you can see that on the, on the left. The burnished gold background we see in the 2012 image, the gold giving the name Golden Haggadah, is markedly different in the newer imagery that we see on the left. We might also notice some differences in colour and detail. On the right image, the red is a somewhat brighter. In an article from 1993, Murray McGillivray considered the potential for electronic representation of digital manuscripts. McGillivray's interest is in Chaucer manuscripts and he imagines a tomorrow's world in which a scholar located in a university in a remote part of the Canadian prairie, could enter a cubicle in the library, strap on various sensory input devices, like a visor, gloves, and other items, and spend an hour or two enjoying the experience of sitting in a virtual Bodleian library, flipping the virtual pages of Bodleian Manuscript Fairfax 16, turning it over to examine the, the binding, feeling the texture of the parchment to look closely, seeing whether that rough patch was really an erasure and so on. Listen to the sound of turning the, the pages, even the smell of a codex, McGillivray argues, is part of the experience of encountering a medieval manuscript. It's fair to say, he says, the whole body is at work when we read a medieval manuscript. And this imaginary future technology is the kind of thing people need. I think I'll be needing this anymore. For the most part, we haven't entered McGillivray's 
imagined world of strap-on devices. Perhaps the most well-known of an early attempt to model a medieval manuscript of the British Library's Turning the Pages project, Armadillo New Media Communications describes Turning the Pages as the ultimate in creating the illusion of actually using a fully three-dimensional book. Using the exact dimensions of the chosen book, we cre create a precise 3D model of it. This means that the shape of the pages as they turn can be exactly the same as the original. After all, 8th century vellum turns very differently to 17th century paper. The result is astonishing, they say. It's a true digital facsimile, allowing visitors to experience the book as it really is. The arts correspondent for The Guardian imagines a scenario in which you have been allowed to handle one of the world's oldest and most precious books. But as you turn the pages, you notice with horror, the paper is starting to crinkle under your fingers. It's the paper of the world's oldest book. For such fragile manuscripts, crinkles are but a step away from cracks and tears. This frisson of nightmares to date been available only to a few privileged scholars permitted to touch the books. Remember that when someone says why you're a manuscript scholar, it's that you can say it's because you enjoy the frisson of nightmare of crinkles turning to cracks and tears. But from today, this nightmare can be shared by all the 10 million UK households who are online. The electronic facsimiles are so realistic, the pages do appear to crinkle as they're turned by mouse clicks. However, the damage, you'd be relieved to know, is an illusion. So let's have a look at the Turning the Pages project. This is, again, the Golden Haggadah. Look at the way the pages leap up to meet the mouse pointer, sort of like a hyperactive puppy welcoming you. Here they are, realistically, turning the pages of the, of the manuscript. Let me turn another one. Um, if you pull too far a diagonal, the page kind of folds in a, whoops, one second. Okay, I've got it. I'm going to fold in a very strange way that I've never seen vellum do. But on the other hand, I'm not sure I would want vellum to do that. Here it is. Doc Porter responds to this by saying, a turn in the pages model of a manuscript is not in fact a true digital facsimile. It is a collection of pretty pictures that move pleasantly. And that is all. And here's Doc Porter turning the pages of a real physical object. Hopefully you can hear the sound of the paper coming. Presumably the sound is on, otherwise you wouldn't have the Very different to the turning the pages simulation as I'm sure you agree. In terms of scholarly activity, we've moved away from the turning the pages approach to IIIF, which offers the benefit of comparing a number of different manuscripts alongside each other. Here you can see openings of the Canterbury Tales from two different manuscripts. In terms of the three-dimensional modeling of a particular medieval artifact, very impressive work has been done by Adi Kainan Schunbart on material from the British Library's collection. So here you can see a flat image from the digitized manuscript site of additional manuscript 4709, which is a 15th century Bible and other material. And here is Adi's three-dimensional representation of it. So think back to Codex Amiatinus. This gives you some sense, if not of the actual awesome size of the thing, at least the thickness of the, of the manuscript you can zoom in, and something of its physical form. Even more helpful is Kainu Shumbat's modeling of Chinese oracle bones. So here again is a very nice high resolution image. Wow, look at that. From the British Library's digitized manuscript sites. And here we see Kainu Shumbat's three-dimensional modeling of it, which allows us to really understand something of the physicality of the object that the flat digital object didn't communicate with. We're just gonna Turn it around and have a look at the back. One second. Whoops, zoom, okay. And oh, you can really see the writing there. It's a resolution image. Another approach is reflectance transformation imaging, RTI, which we can see here demonstrated by John McEwen at last year's Dark Archives. The idea is to use a fixed camera and to take lots of images with 
different lighting conditions and John's moving his torch around the, uh, around the tripod there. And then to put these together in a kind of animated form. So here we see an example of this. As I move my mouse around this, around this seal, hopefully what you'll see is the light conditions changing to give a greater sense of the three-dimensional properties of this, of this seal and enhance our understanding of it. So still not the manuscript of the seal, but an attempt to represent more of that than we might see from the standard flat static image. John McEwen's RTI images very much call to mind Segalen Tart's invocation of ekphrasis. Ekphrasis, she says, is the porting from one medium to another, whereby a material object is transformed into another object with the aim of transmitting meaning. This new meaning, this associated interpretation and its appended narrative are therefore linked to the new medium. Like many most or all of us, my teaching is going to be online this term. So rather than being in the Bodleian Library, looking at manuscripts with students, I will be taking advantage not only of digital surrogates, but the potential to look at facsimile editions with the benefit of my trusty iPhone and a tripod to give a greater sense of the three dimensionality of the object. So what we're going to do is we're going to go next door to my imaging studio to have a quick look at that. See you in a second. So hello, so here we are. We can examine a physical object live or semi-live, I guess it's a recording. I'm live. Can open it up. Turn the pages. And using the phone, we can zoom in on any details that we like. Obviously, what we have to do is ask ourselves what the added value is in doing this in this way, as opposed to, to an online digital surrogate. I'd like to conclude by looking at Bill Enders' 3D virtualization of the Chad Gospels. This is exciting, this is cool. It gives a sense of wonder of the medieval manuscript that the flat images simply cannot communicate. Here's Enders talking about the project. 3D flyovers offer a more intimate experience than 2D images, giving viewers a feeling of a manuscript's dynamic nature, perhaps even inspiring awe as desired by the medieval artist who illuminated the St. Chad Gospels. More importantly for researchers, 3D reveals significant information about a page's contours and condition, along with the layout of its text, its decorative flow, and artistic flourishes. The density of data in 3D meshes offers opportunities to generate further information. One of particular usefulness for manuscripts is taking accurate measurements. Holes, flaking pigments, and features of letters and decoration can be measured for conservation and scholarly purposes. As well as the scholarly applications that Enders mentions here, there really is a sense of being able to take a deep dive into a manuscript page. And you can try that for yourself on the Litchfield Cathedral Archive website. Here we are, Give you an example of this. So we can turn the page of It's the left, turn it round. And this is a very different experience to the flat digitized manuscript image that we might see most commonly. It's kind of impossible not to be upstaged by Bill Enders' visualizations. And I see at any rate that I'm really out of time. So I'm actually going to allow a surrogate to say thank you. Thank you guys so much. I have to say this is a little overwhelming for a nice Jewish boy.